Good morning, Crosspoint. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. So welcome back to Crosspoint Online. And no, we're not back in lockdown, which is really great news. But we have decided to record some of our sermons for people who missed out or for anyone else who might be interested. Now, we don't have recording equipment uh, at, Baptist, at Crosspoint Baptist, so here I am back at Pakenham Baptist Church uh, with my friend Mark Munro recording for us. So thank you to Mark and also to Pakenham Baptist. Now today we're going to talk about the purpose of church. Now when I say church, I do not mean, you know, the designated church buildings where people gather to meet. I'm actually talking about the people of God. And the term church could also mean the, you know, the global church, the, you know, all of the people of God all over the world. But today I'm talking more specifically about the uh, specific groups of people that gather in different places uh, together. Some groups do meet in their own own designated church building, but other groups meet in homes. Some people meet outdoors in parks. Uh, people can meet in community buildings or factories or in churches, which is what we do at Crosspoint Baptist and a special shout out to Rivercrest Christian School in Clyde. But why is it important to gather together in groups? You know, modern technology means that we can hear great worship music at home, in the car, anytime we like. We can hear some great teaching and some powerful sermons from world-class preachers anytime we like. So why does Hebrews 10.25 tell us not to stop gathering together? Well, at Crosspoint Church, we've recently been transplanted to Clyde North, and even more recently, we've voted to stay in Clyde North and try to establish ourselves as a church there. So as we consider our vision uh, and the specific um, purposes that we have uh, in Clyde North, I thought it was timely to remember the bigger picture. Why are we here? Why do we gather like this? What is the point? What is the purpose? So that will be the focus of today's message. So first of all, we'll have a look at something from the Word of God, and Nathan is going to read to us now from 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 to 27. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all of those parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptised by one spirit to form one body, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free and we're all given one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made of one part, but of many. Now if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and the parts that we think are less honourable we treat with special honour. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honour to the parts that liked it, so that there should be no division in the body but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Thank you, Nathan. So all of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. All of us are part of the church, and all of us have a part to play. So today we're looking at the purpose of church. So first of all, a little bit of history. 
So not our immediate history at Crosspoint, but a history of the origin of the church. So when and why uh, was the whole concept of church first established? The first time the word church is mentioned in the Bible is actually in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, where Jesus is speaking and Jesus says to Simon Peter, he says, Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. So it was Jesus who planted and established the church, and it is Jesus who will build the church. There was once, once a man called Gregory Elder. Now, Gregory wrote uh, his story, and he grew up uh, on the beach, you know, on, on the coast next to a beach, and he spent many, many days, many hours um, down at the beach. And he learned to build uh, some beautiful, intricate sandcastles. He would spend hours creating whole little cities of sandcastles and towers and channels, and uh, he was very good, very creative. That was his hobby. He enjoyed it, and he was very good at it. But one day... Uh, for several days in a row, some bullies would come along in the afternoon and they would just trample down and destroy all his artwork. And this was obviously frustrating for Gregory, so one day he tried an experiment. So he placed a rock or a, a brick or a lump of concrete at the base of each one of his uh, constructions and then he would build his, uh, you know, his sandcastles on top of the lump of concrete. And that afternoon when he saw the bullies coming, he, he went away to hide and to watch. And of course the bullies came down and they started to kick his sandcastles. And it's fair to say their toes came off second best. And Gregory writes that many people question the sustainability of the church. Some people think the church is dying. People think the church cannot last. You know, people, people outside the church, they say that we're you know, old fashioned and out of date and irrelevant and obsolete. Even some people inside the church, you know, do worry that persecution and church politics and bad theology and plain old sin uh, could eventually destroy the church from within. And all of those things certainly can and do weaken the church. But Gregory Elder, the maker of the sandcastles, says, these people forget that the church is built upon a rock. And so I kind of like to imagine those people who set out to destroy the church and they find that the church is not made of sand, the church is built on solid rock. So nothing can ever destroy the church of God. Jesus built it on a rock solid foundation and even the gates of hell cannot conquer the church. So that's good news and that's good to remember. In Matthew chapter seven, uh, during the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus told a little parable about uh, a house, about, he says, a house built on sand will collapse. But Jesus tells us, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it will not collapse because it is built on bedrock. So the church was established by Jesus. It is built on a firm foundation and it is built to last. Now, if you've ever read the book of Acts or any church history books, you will know that the church has indeed survived despite many obstacles. In the book of Acts, we read about the early church. You could really say that it was in Acts chapter 2 that the first church was really uh, established, that it really arrived. Obviously, by then, lots of grand work had already been done. The whole life of Jesus and all his teachings, uh, his death and his resurrection, his ascension to heaven, uh, with his promise that the Holy Spirit would come. And then in Acts chapter 2, we read about um, you know, the day of Pentecost. The believers were all together, and suddenly there was a sound from heaven. Uh, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and God gave uh, some of them the ability to speak in other languages. Now at that time, there was people from all over the known world had gathered together in Jerusalem and they all heard the noise and they came running to see what, what it was, what was going on and the crowds were astonished because each one of them heard the apostles speaking in their own native language. Obviously the apostles were speaking in probably Aramaic or, or maybe Greek, you know, their own, their own language, but everyone heard in their own language, which was clearly a miracle and then Simon Peter stood up and he preached to the crowd and he explained to them all that Jesus was the Messiah. 
and he proved it from Old Testament prophecies. He mentioned facts which they already knew to be true, and he just built his case, and the people listened. Peter was inspired by the Holy Spirit, and Jesus laid the foundation of the church. And then as Jesus promised, the Holy Spirit came and he empowered the church and the crowds responded that day and 3,000 people joined the church that day. And that really, you know, the church was off and running from that day forth. The church was established and it has continued to grow ever since. So what was the church like in those early, early days? Well, that's chapter 2, verse 42. is really a, a description of the early church. And it says that all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. Let's read that again. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. All the believers. This wasn't just the apostles. This wasn't just the leaders. This wasn't just the fanatics. This was all the believers devoted themselves. Everyone was involved. Everyone was devoted to the cause. At the end of 2015, um, someone gave Tracy and I a a very generous uh, gift. And with the whole family, we went on a cruise uh, on a ship. And it was great and we enjoyed it very much. And a cruise ship It really is a holiday. All the cooking is done for you. All the cleaning is done for you. There is entertainment available. You can do as much or as little as you like. There were about 3,000 people on that ship. 2,000 of them were just doing nothing, just enjoying, enjoying everything and being pampered and relaxing. But the other 1,000, well, they had to do all of the work for all of the passengers. So the passengers just relax and take it easy, but for the crew, it is not so much fun. It's all work and no fun. The church is not like a cruise ship, where some people do all the work and everyone else just sits back and enjoys the show. No, the church is more like a Navy ship. See, on a Navy ship, everyone has a job. Everyone has a purpose. Obviously, jobs can be shared and there might be multiple people trained in each particular job and they'll take it in turns being responsible for that job. But everyone has a job. And if one person does not do their job, then everyone else might suffer the negative effects. So the church is not like a cruise ship. The church is like a navy ship and it is important for us all to play our part. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14 says, God makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. As each part does its job, it helps the whole body be healthy and growing and full of love. So it doesn't matter how many parts there are, what matters more is that each part is connected. Each part is working with the others and each part is being cared for. And now some people obsess about church growth, as in you know, the numbers, the numerical growth, but I think the church health is actually more important. If a church is healthy, then the church will grow. And sometimes that might be numerical growth, but more important is spiritual growth and individual growth and uh, as we individually and collectively grow in our faith. We grow in our knowledge of Jesus Christ and we grow in, grow to maturity as followers of Jesus. And to grow spiritually, we need to learn. And to learn, we need people to teach. In 2006, uh, some researchers um, published a study which had been done on how ants behave. You know, you all know ants, tiny little creatures, very, very industrious, hardworking, always busy little things. Now, according to this study, if an ant goes out by itself just to search for food, it can take quite a while to locate a source of food. So once one of the worker ants does locate some food, uh, it's, uh, it will find another ant to, and show that ant where the food was. So the, they would go out and file. The leader ant would take the student ant to where the food is. And they did this using a system which the researchers called tandem running. 
the leading ant heads off towards the uh, food source and the second ant, the student ant, will follow along. But ever so often the student ant will stop and it will look around and get its bearings and probably, um, we imagine, take note of some of the landmarks so that it can find its way back again without help. So it doesn't have to follow the first one each time. And every time the student ant stops, the leading ant also has to stop and wait until the student ant is ready to continue. So this means, of course, that the leading ant actually uh, has to waste a little bit of his time, or her term, waiting for its friend. But in the long run, the whole society benefits because then both of them know the way and they can both go to and fro full bore, or either or both of them can go and show some others the way to the food source. So this is a great lesson for the church because it is worth investing our time into training someone else to do our job. If you know how to do a job, the easiest thing is just to go ahead and get it done. And I know I'm, I'm guilty of that myself. It's just quicker and easier that way just to do it yourself. But if we take the time to show someone else and wait patiently while they learn, then the church benefits. Because more people can share the work, uh, more people can learn, and more people can grow. So we can learn from the ants. But we need to remember we are not ants, we are human beings. And so we're not all the same. We all have different gifts. We have many gifts, and each one of those gifts is important. Just like the different parts of the human body, each one is important. Each part is important. The Boeing 747, better known as the Jumbo Jet, was first flown in 1969. And for many years, the Boeing 747 was the largest passenger aircraft in service uh, in the world. Uh, they're still in service today. And so the day that the very first Boeing 747 took off for its maiden voyage was obviously a very big day for the Boeing company. Many people had worked for a long time on the design of that aircraft and to see it completed and working uh, was a really great event. Now there was one man, one man who spent 15 years of his working life working on one design feature that was used in that aircraft. One part. He, he spent 15 years designing and testing and perfecting a switch box. A, one part around about the size of a loaf of bread. Um, no passenger ever saw that part. No awards were given out for that part. No articles were written about that part. But without that part, the Boeing 747 would not be as safe as it is. See, every single part matters, just as every single person matters in God's church. That verse from Ephesians 4 that, that we read, when the body or the church works together, we help other parts or other people to grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Growing and full of love. Now, as we know from the book of Acts and from church history, the church did grow, the church spread out uh, despite and sometimes because of the persecution and the opposition that it faced. And the apostles in the book of Acts and missionaries ever since then have followed Jesus' instruction to go out into all the world and to, to make disciples and to teach them all of the things that Jesus taught us. And the Bible tells us often to love each other. The Bible tells us to love our neighbours. It also tells us to love our enemies. Now, sometimes, occasionally, our neighbours might also be our enemies, in which case we have to love them doubly. But the church itself... The church should always be a safe place. I mean, legally, people at church need to be safe from abuse. And biblically, we should also be safe from slander, safe from gossip, safe from bullying. The church should be full of love. If we look at, go back to that verse from Acts uh, 2.42, we see that the believers were devoted to the teaching and to fellowship and to sharing and to prayer. Lots of fellowship, lots of sharing. Reading between the lines, it's easy to see that they were filled with love for each other. Now, Nathan read to us earlier from 1 Corinthians 12, which says, Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If a foot says I'm not a hand, oh, sorry, if a foot says I'm not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, 
that does not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, oh, I'm not part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it only had one part. Yes, there were many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can never say to the feet, I don't need you. So the church of God was planted by Jesus. It was built on a rock and it can and it will and it does survive against everything that is thrown against it. The church is inspired and empowered by the Holy Spirit. So what is our role in the church? What part do we each individually play? Well, we should all love. We should all, we can all teach something. We can all work together. See, Acts 2 described to us how that the early church was devoted to teaching and to fellowship and to sharing and to prayer. And that is a great model for all of us to imitate. Ephesians 4 told us that the, the body, that God fits the body together so that when we each do our part, then the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Does anyone remember the name Eric Muzambani? Sorry. If you don't, he was a participant in the Sydney Olympics in the year 2000 and he became known as Eric the Eel. One headline described him as the man who nearly drowned but accidentally sent, set an Olympic record. So Eric, the eel, Eric Muzambani, was from Equatorial Guinea, which is on the west coast of Africa. Now Eric, uh, he was competing in the 100 metres freestyle swimming event. Now his country did not have a single Olympic sized swimming pool in the entire country. The only swimming pool Eric had ever trained in was only 12 metres long. So for him, 100 metres, up, up a 50 metre pool and all the way back, that was a long way for him to swim. And halfway down the second lap, well, he nearly stopped. If you've ever seen the footage, honestly, people were starting to worry that, um, you know, that he was floundering, he was barely moving. People genuinely thought he might, this guy might drown, you know, the lifesavers at the Olympics were finally going to have a job to do. And um, some people were worried he might sink, but the crowd was desperately cheering him on. And finally, you know, gasping for air and with his arms flailing, he reached the finish line to an enormous ovation from the crowd. And Eric did beat an Olympic record. So Eric, it turned out he was competing by himself because both of the other swimmers in that heat were, had been disqualified because of a, a false start. And so Eric broke the Olympic record for the longest ever time for first place in a 100 metres race. Not exactly the record that you set out you know, that you aspire to. But after the race, Eric was interviewed and he said, I want to send hugs and kisses to the crowd. It was their cheering that kept me going. So at the Olympic Games, it's normally only the very best athletes who can compete. Eric was an exception because, you know, some um, special exemptions were given to, to developing countries to, you know, some concessions to, to assist them and support them and encourage them. And so most of us will never be able to compete in the Olympic Games. The best that we can all do is to watch and to cheer. But unlike the Olympic Games, the church was never intended to be a spectator sport. We can all enter, we can all participate, we can all use our different gifts and our different talents. There is one way in which the church is like the Olympic Games, and that is that we can all cheer and encourage one another. If you see someone doing really well, encourage them. If you see someone who's really struggling, cheer for them as well. See, Eric was really struggling in that swimming race, but the encouragement of the supporters and the fans kept him going, and so he finished his race, and he actually became a legend. And you know now, because of his influence, Equatorial Guinea now has two Olympic size swimming pools. So there are far better opportunities now for future generations because of Eric Muzambani. In churches, we might find people who 
maybe they don't, ha don't have the same training we have. They might have different gifts than we have. They may not have had the same opportunities that we all have. They might have faced different challenges than we have. They might be struggling to stay afloat. And we, as a church and as individuals, we can encourage, we can support, we can teach, we can love, and we can pray. That, my friends, is the purpose of church. To help each other along, to work together. We can all participate. So that's why it's worth going to church. That's why it's worth gathering together with God's people, regardless of where you meet. We all need each other. We are better off in community. We're better off being part of a team. We can all help each other, support each other, encourage each other, and teach each other. We need each other. As Nathan read for us earlier, if one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honoured, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. Amen? Amen. Let's all pray together. <clears throat> Father God, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for the, for the church that you, you established, you planted, you founded, you built. And it is a great thing. Many of us, many people have been so blessed by churches. Lord, whatever form or shape churches look like, when people gather together in your name to serve you, to worship you, to work together for your cause, we just ask your blessing on them, all the different styles of church all over the world. And we pray for Cross Point and Packenham Baps and local churches in this area that you bless them and empower us all to reach, reach our community with your love. Lord, we're so grateful to be your servants and your children. And now uh, we just ask that churches all over the world will bring you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll see you again soon.